let's open our Bibles to Revelation chapter 6, verse 2. As you're opening them, uh, Bonnie and I not only are so grateful, and I can't wait to, to share a complete report of our uh, Southeast Asia time, but we're so grateful for your prayers because during the two weeks that we were traveling, in spite of the thousands of sick people we were around and all the dying chickens and bird flu stuff and everything else, we were remarkably perfectly for speaking 35 times. I didn't have a problem with my voice. However, the day we got home, I got sick. And it's because, you know, everyone prayed and then they stopped. And so why I'm saying that is that uh, tomorrow uh, morning early, I fly to the Christian Medical Dental Association. There are 10,000 Christian doctors in America, and they're adding Christian physicians, assistants, and nurses, and pharmacists, and all kinds of things. But um, there are missionaries that work in the local chapters. There are uh, almost 200 local chapters that all these doctors are a part of, and these are like chaplains to the medical professionals. And they work in the medical schools, they work all over the country, and all these missionaries are coming into the Christian Medical Dental Association headquarters in Tennessee, and they're kind of worn out. And the president of the outfit called me and said, he said, could you come like a medic? And I said, oh, I'd love to come as a medic. And after I agreed, he said, these are the five sermons I want you to preach. And I should have never agreed to that. I don't do a la carte, you know. Uh, wherever I speak, I just give whatever I spoke on at Calvary last, you know. Well, he said, I want you to speak Monday night on this and Tuesday morning and Tuesday night and Wednesday morning and, and Thursday morning on this. And that's almost killed me. So pray for tomorrow night through early Thursday morning as I talk to these frontline missionaries. Some are from InterVarsity and Crusade, and um, I forget all the different uh, ministries that support them, but these are full-time on the front lines, especially with medical students that are believers that are being buffeted by what we're going to look at this morning with the gale force winds against God that are in our world. And, and many of them are, are struggling. Um, they, they're working so hard in their ministries that they don't have time with their children, they don't have time with their wife, they have hardly any time with the Lord. And, and basically, what I'm going to tell them is that anything that's out of control in your life isn't under the Lord's control. And so it doesn't matter how many medical students you help, if you're not under control, that doesn't please the Lord. So you can pray about that and uh, go with me in ministry. Chapter 6 of Revelation introduces us to when the whole world begins believing the lie. Parts of the world have always believed the lie. By the time we get to Revelation 6, the whole world embraces the lie. And the, the need this morning is to know that we, each of us individually, are anchored in the truth. Now, have you noticed how strong the winds of apostasy are blowing? Uh, it is an illustration of my own life. Uh, I was trying to... Uh, do a little work for, you know, and everybody gets nervous when I do work. My landlord came by and, you know, he wanted to check that I wasn't hurting anything. But uh, uh, I was trying to get ready for Bonnie coming home and, and we live in Lawton and the winds really blow hard there. And so I had wrestled together and tied all the cords together and got the blower. I was going to blow off the whole, all the junk off the driveway uh, that blows on. And I got it all cranked on and I turned it on. And as I first blew it, it went up and the prevailing winds brought it back further, you know. And I thought how strong the winds are that blow against us when we think of that doctrinally. When we go with the doctrine of Christ out into this world, we're blown back by the almost universal political incorrectness it is to declare truth nowadays. And the winds are just getting stronger and stronger and stronger. And more and more individuals who claim that they're born-again Christians and go to churches that claim to be followers of Christ and denominations are all slowly caving in to public opinion and societal pressures. I mean, just recently um, when I was meeting with, with uh, the Gilcreases and they were just giving me a pulse of professional sports and with all this coming out of all the homosexual athletes that are coming out. And, and if anybody dares to say anything negative, the media and society is just all over them as if you could say anything is wrong in anybody's life. That's where our world is. And apostasy, apohistemi, 
apo means from and histomy means stand. And what apostasy is, that if there used to be a stand right here that God believes this, the person standing there is moving away. Apostasy is to move away from a previously held stand on truth. Not opinions, truth. Doctrines that used to be bedrock are abandoned fast by churches, believers, denominations. And Satan, the God of this world, is more at work than ever. Satan is older, he is smarter, and now he has a vast communication system of the world media consumption. It's almost like every event now in the world is being globally participated in. There's nothing that happens, it's just alone. I mean, some Syrian rebel does something, it's everybody sees it. And that's just how our world is getting. And so the societal pressure the prevailing wind blowing against any solid doctrinal stand is almost pushing them over. And that's what apostasy is all about. Our world is slowly self-defining God. Our world is slowly self-defining God's laws instead of honoring his word. In fact, what the world doesn't realize is that The reason that murder is wrong is God said you cannot destroy someone that he has created in his image. Did you know if you take away the basis and it's just there are no laws, then murder is just an interruption to your life, not mine, so there's nothing wrong with it as long as I can go on with my life. And and the world will become increasingly amoral and lawless, anomia, with no laws. And that's, I mean, I don't think some people have really realized you can't pick and choose rules. Either God's rules are absolute or there's no basis for societal rules, just societal pressures and public opinion. And so what Jesus said is we need to beware of apostasy, of leaving a previously stood for doctrine. And so Jesus warned beware of apostasy. And apostasy is not just a denial of the deity of Christ. I mean, classically, we've always thought of apostasy as someone that believed in the resurrection of Christ and now they deny it, or they believed in the deity of Christ and now they deny it, and they called that apostasy, or in the triunity of God. But apostasy also encompasses the denial of the creator, as described in the Bible, and the substitution of ideas postulated by his creatures as being more authoritative than the record he left. That's a form of apostasy of denying what God said and moving away from a previously held position. Apostasy also denies that life begins at conception, even though the Bible says that. Apostasy denies that. Apostasy denies that marriage was designed by God for only a woman and a man, and that homosexuality is a sin. Apostasy denies that, just like fornication, adultery, and drunkenness are. And they've already denied all those are sins, so why not just keep going, see? You just start unraveling and there's nothing left. Apostasy denies that lying and stealing and pride and haughtiness and greed and disobedience to parents and drug usage and witchcraft are abominable to God. But the Bible says all the above. Jesus said, beware of apostasy. The winds are blowing stronger every day away from God in this world. It's like the start of a hurricane. Every hour in the hurricane season, when a hurricane's approaching, the wind gets stronger and stronger and stronger. It's not like a tornado like blew through Texas last week. A hurricane comes and it stays hour after hour after hour. And you can grab, I mean, we, we lived through, uh, uh, Stella and Johnny were little, but we were in the Parsonage, this 200 or 160 year old structure. And one of the half of it had blown away in the 38 hurricane, and we thought the other half was going to blow away in the one we were at. And, and this, this majestic tree that, that was ramrod straight, hour after hour, it just started, you could just see it leaning like the Tower of Pizza because it's just, it's just the increasing wind speed is overwhelming to structures. And that's what we live in today. And ahead of us are stronger and stronger winds of false doctrine that are going to cause more and more to fall away from orthodoxy. And then the winds will build to epic proportions when we get to Revelation 6 and verse 2. And that epic proportion is the white horse of deception. That's where we're headed. 
And what we're going to read about this morning is when the winds that are already blowing against God, when God allows once and for all global deception to permeate at every level. He's been withholding it. He's been holding back and restraining, as the Bible calls it, through the restrainer. But the time is coming when he's pulling the control rods out, and this is going to be universal belief in the lie. So follow along in your Bibles, Revelation chapter 6, as we hear God launch the tribulation. Let's stand together for the reading of God's Word. Remain standing for prayer. Listen to these words. John is speaking, verse 1, Revelation 6. Now I saw when the Lamb opened one of the seals, and I heard one of the four living creatures saying with a voice like thunder, come and see, verse 2, and I looked. And behold, a white horse, and he who sat on it had a bow, and a crown was given to him. And he went out, conquering and to conquer. Let's bow for a word of prayer. Father, I pray that we would seriously this morning examine whether we are moored, anchored to the doctrine of Christ whether we know the truth and whether we can discern error. And I pray that we would become truth lovers and truth defenders in this world when it seems like everyone is caving in to public pressure to to not be negative. And yet you've said, if anyone denies the doctrine of Christ, they are not his. And we are not to welcome them or to bid them your blessing, or even allow them into our home. I pray that we would be anchored to the doctrine of Christ. Teach us from your word this morning, I pray. In Jesus' precious name, amen. You may be seated as you're seated. Remember that when Jesus came, he came as the truth. He says, I am the way to God. I am the truth about God. I am the life that God promised. Jesus said, if you know me, the truth will set you free. And so Jesus was all about truth. Satan is the anti-truth. Satan is the deceiver. And this seal, number one, is the global embracing of the lie of Satan. That we don't need God. That we don't need Christ. That he is going to give the man's version of Christ. The superman. The antichrist. The one in Christ's place. That's what's going on here. Last time we saw that each truly born-again person, first and above all else, the scriptures say, is a lover of truth. Now, uh, on Wednesday night, we have the biblical counseling and discipling class, and and usually there's a little group that goes out and evangelizes while we're in class, and they check in with us, they remember to pray, and then they go out and evangelize, and then they come back at the end of class and tell us what happened. And, And on Wednesday, this was happening again, and they went out, and they witnessed, and they came back, and they had a question. They said, now this is the track we use. Do you think that's a good gospel presentation? I said, you know what? Any gospel presentation is a good gospel presentation if it's from the Word of God. But it's not how powerful the gospel presentation is. It's whether the Lord is working in their hearts. You see, if they never have the Lord begin to warm their heart, begin to soften their heart, begin to open their eyes, everyone is born blind. You can hold as many things in front of them as you want. They can't see it. The, the one that begins to, to help them see is the Spirit of God. He's the one that, that gives them a love for the truth. I, I saw this. I mean, I was sitting with Bonnie, and we were in a high-rise in China. We had an appointment with a, a Mongolian executive. I didn't even know they had executives in Mongolia. I thought everybody rode a horse and lived in a hut, you know. But here's a Mongolian executive woman, no less, highly educated, sitting with Bonnie. And, and I was watching this go on, and, and, and the, it was going back and forth, the questions. And all of a sudden, this woman looked at Bonnie and she said, now I want to read the Word of God. And, and what it was is she, she had, had impediments. I mean, she wanted to make sure that this was, I mean, there's many words of God. You know, there's Buddha's words of God. And how do you know this is the words of God? But as soon as from the Word, those, those little questions were answered, she said, now I want to read the Word. She began to long for the truth. Satan is the antithesis of the truth. Believers are lovers of the truth. And Revelation 6, 1 and 2 says, God launches this white horseman. 
This is God's plan. The world has not wanted the truth for so long. God says, okay, I'm going to give you the ultimate delusion. I'm going to pull out all of the restraints, and Satan can be the great deceiver he is, with no withholding him. But all the time, God is in control. You see in verse 2, it's the Lamb. It's Jesus Christ who died on the cross, the one that opens the seal. The white horseman is a reminder from God that this coming Antichrist initially conquers, but he conquers not militarily. He conquers because God gives him the platform. He gives him the microphone. He lets the lie fill the earth. Remember, in Revelation 6-2, God grants, allows, and gives to Satan's plans the power to deceive the world. God is always almighty, even during the tribulation, even during the deception, and God allows nothing that does not fit within his plan, and he's actively working. And so, look at verse 2. It says in verse 2, he was given a crown and he went out. Now, to see this play out, go to chapter 13. This is just, by the way, in chapter 13, we see the ultimate end of what's launched in the first seal. The first seal, the white horse and the rider, is not the Antichrist riding the horse. It's deception going in. None of these horses are people. They're they're forces that permeate the earth, and there are four of them. And we're going to see if the Lord doesn't return, the second horse soon. But, but in chapter 13, look at what it says in verse 5. This chapter is detailing more about the Antichrist than any other. And the emphasis is all the way through starting in verse 5 is that God is the one that allows this. Verse 5, and he was given a mouth speaking great things. God allows the devil to energize this communicator. That's why I said last week, he probably, or the week before, he's probably a dodo. He probably is tongue-tied until the Spirit of God, restraining the, the lie, takes back his restraint, and Satan can energize this man to become what it says here, a mouth speaking great things and blasphemies. And he was given authority. Notice it was given to him to continue for 42 months. Look at verse 6. He opened his mouth in blasphemy against God to blaspheme his name, his tabernacle, and those who dwell on the earth. And verse 7 says, it was granted to him to make war on the saints. Remember, we saw two weeks ago that more people are going to be saved out of the tribulation than can be numbered, and out of this time is going to be this, this horrific martyrdom. But it isn't an accident. Look, look what it says in verse 7. It was granted to him to make war with the saints and to overcome them. And authority was given him. Now, this is the first time this ever happens. Look at the end of verse 7. Authority was given him over every tribe, tongue, and nation. That's a, a nice way of saying over everybody. You know, for centuries, people have tried to conquer the world, from Babylon and its empire, to Persia and their empire, to the Greeks and Alexander going lightning speed all over the world, to the mighty Roman Empire, all the way through the Khans, all the way right down to Hitler and, and communism. Everyone has tried to control the world, but there's always been an element that withstood and restrained and withheld global conquest until right there. And in verse 7, it's the first time there's a united humanity, the first time since the Tower of Babel in Genesis 11, and the whole world is united against God, believing the lie, and God allows it. So the power granted in Revelation 13, 7 is actually, if you turn back now to chapter 6, verse 2, it's actually the crown that was given to this deception. God right up front is allowing this global deception that culminates in the Antichrist's reign. God is in control. So basically... That's why Jesus Christ warned over and over again about the coming hurricane of apostasy. What he said is, and Paul talks about it, he says, the winds are blowing against the things of God back here in the first century, but they're only going to keep blowing, and every year they're going to be blowing more and more and more and more deceivers and more and more deception until you get the crescendo right here in Revelation 6-2. And it culminates in the Antichrist. Now, last time we ended in 2 Thessalonians, let me take you back there because we really didn't finish, okay? 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. And I want to show you, Paul makes four points that explains 
What's happening in the global deception? So 2 Thessalonians, uh, Acts, Romans, 1 Corinthians, Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians, 1 and 2 Thessalonians. We celebrated 10 little uh, people that had learned to skillfully know all the books of the Bible in first service, and they can say them forwards and backwards, and they can find any verse in the Bible. I announced in first service, I said, we ought to do that in the adult life groups and see if everybody passes, you know. When I was uh, in Sunday school, you couldn't get out of the fourth grade at Lake Lansing Baptist Church when I was a little boy. You could not graduate to the fifth grade, no matter how old you were, if you could not find within your Bible any, you know, they would say Zephaniah and you'd have to go, you know, and and you would have to stand in front of them until you got to Zephaniah 3.3 or whatever. And I remember there were a couple college kids that were still in the fourth grade, you know. And it was really embarrassing. You know, peer pressure gradually got them to learn that, and we ought to keep that up. But look at 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. Because what the Scriptures tell us is this hurricane of apostasy is coming so fast, and it's going to follow exactly the plan the Lord laid down. 2 Thessalonians gives us four elements, starting in verse 3 of chapter 2. First, truth gets abandoned. That's, that's the first hallmark of the apostasy is that truth gets abandoned. Now, it's happening all around us. I mean, what people say is, you know, don't sweat the little stuff like the truth, you know. Just worry about the big stuff. Well, what is bigger than the truth? But you know what? People nowadays aren't interested in knowing the truth. You know, testimony, uh, I'm... 57, I've been teaching publicly in all, every venue for 35 years. 35 years ago, people couldn't get enough of the truth. I mean, we didn't have any of all this, you know, electronic stuff. It was just plain paper Bibles and mimeograph that were barely legible note things. And, and they just, when I would go to a Bible conference and speak at a Bible conference, they would have three sessions. They'd have the morning session, they'd have the afternoon session, they'd have the evening session. And each... I mean, it was a few songs, and then it was teaching the Bible. I mean, people just couldn't get enough of it. I'm still doing it. Do you know what it's now? These directors of all these conference centers, they're my friends, and they go, you know, people back home only go for 15-minute sermons. 20 is a long one. They said, one of your messages is like a month of everything they'd get back home. And they said, and so what we're going to do is we're going to cut down and only have one a day. Because, you know, people need to play golf and ride their scooters and, you know, I mean, they, they don't come to a Bible conference for the Bible and for truth. They come to relax, and it's very not relaxing to sit and, you know, so we're going to cut it down. And, and it's people no longer love truth. They tolerate it. Look at the worship services. We call them worship services. Worship is spirit and truth, emphasis truth. But, but people want a show, and then they want a dollop of whipped cream at the end, you know, a little Bible something, you know. It doesn't Bible light, just make sure it's light and just upbeat. Nothing heavy, nothing negative, nothing divisive. And that's what, look at what it says. In verse 3, let no one deceive you by any means, for that day will not come unless the falling away comes first. And the man of sin is revealed, the son of perdition. So truth is slowly getting abandoned. It's slowly getting marginalized. It's slowly getting neglected. And we see it already. I, I mean, when I was uh, way back in the, in the 80s, I remember going to a, a conference for pastors, and, and it was featuring a church planner from Southern California that had started knocking on doors, and now he had 30,000 people. His name was Rick Warren, and everybody was all over him. He was a very good speaker and a very good Bible teacher. And he was so good that at the end of the service, when he got done teaching, he says, by the way, some of you kind of lack in your Bible teaching skills. He says, I've prepared and out on the tables are for sale for $5. You can buy an entire month of sermons. Now he says, I wrote sermons, I studied it all, and I made the PowerPoints, and I made the handouts, and I made the bulletin announcements, and I did all the illustrations. All you have to do is put in, sprinkle it with a little bit of your stuff, and for $5 a month, it's so hard in the ministry, you can have that, and you don't have to spend all that time. I thought, the pastors don't spend time, the people don't spend time. The pastor goes truth light, the people go truth light. 
As Chaucer used to say, when the gold rusts, what happens to the iron? And boy, are we seeing that across. The, the, the declension of truth is the hallmark. Truth gets abandoned. Look at the next thing it says in verse 4. The, then Almighty God gets pushed aside. When you push out the truth, who needs God? Because he's defined by the truth. And so it says that Almighty God gets pushed aside. Verse 4, who opposes and exalts himself above all that is called God or that is worshipped. He sits as God in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. Do you not remember that when I was still with you I told you these things? Wow. You know what verse 5 says? Gives us a little insight about what first century apostolic preaching was all about. What did Paul preach about? Paul was preaching to them about future events that impacted their present living. Paul talked much about the future. He was explaining to them where God's plan was going. He had no confusion what was going on. We have confusion. People say, oh, it's too confusing, so we aren't going to talk about it. That's when we have abandoned the way it was in the first century. The first century, Paul was telling them there's an antichrist coming, and he's going to be preceded by this declension of truth. And he said, so the way you get ready today is Become a lover of the truth so God doesn't get pushed out of your life. We have man-centered Christianity nowadays. It's personality, it's celebrity, it's people-driven that feel good. And so you, you, you begin to erode the connection, as Jesus said, the people's lives are not founded on the rock or on the sand of whoever the current personality is. And that's why they get blown away. God gets pushed aside. Keep reading verse 7. For the mystery of lawlessness is already at work. Only he who now restrains will do so until he's taken out of the way. And then the lawless one will be revealed, whom the Lord will consume with the breath of his mouth and destroy with the brightness of his coming. See, the Antichrist is preceded by this wholesale departure from truth and the wholesale removal of God. In fact, I just read a, a piece that's really good. It says that God is now weightless. It used to be God exerted weight on everything in life. People felt the weight of God. Even unsaved people, you know, didn't want to offend God. And now God is weightless. But he became weightless in the church first. He, he doesn't... It isn't like people feel the need to hear his voice. He's weightless. He's inert. He is abandoned in many people's lives. They're practicing atheists. They can make it for weeks and months without the Lord, his word, his people. It's amazing what goes as Christendom today that is ungodly. But look at verse 9 of Second Thessalonians 2. First, truth's abandoned, then God's abandoned. And now look what happens in verse 9. Satan amazes the world. I mean, this is the moment everybody's been waiting for. They've been watching the movies about it. I mean, all, all the comic books when I was little are now movies. And, and everybody's just getting conditioned for someone is going to show up that has supernatural power, and it's not going to be inside of a theater, and everybody can't wait for that to happen. And here it is. And it says in verse 9, the coming of the lawless one is according to the workings of Satan, with all power, signs, and lying wonders, and with all unrighteous deception among those who perish. By the way, this guy can call down fire from heaven. I mean, who needs precise guided munitions and hypersonic, uh, you know, missiles when you can just bring down fire from heaven, from the sky? It's like calling down 30,000 degrees centigrade lightning and have it incinerate something. That's what Satan has the power to do. You see it in Job. He brought the tornado through that wiped out the homes. He brought the fire that came through. He, he moved the armies. Satan is the most powerful being. He's more powerful than the Starship Enterprise. You know, I mean, he is very powerful. And he is the highest power of any created being. Even Michael doesn't play around with Satan. He just says, the Lord will take care of you. Michael, the archangel, knows how powerful Satan is. Now he gets to show his lying wonders and all unrighteous deception. But look how verse 10 ends. Among those who perish, look at this, because they did not receive the love of the truth, that they might be saved. The only way someone gets saved, it's not if you give them the right track, it's not if you pray with them the right time, if they repeat it exactly after you. That isn't salvation. 
Salvation is receiving from God on the inside a love for the truth. That's why not everybody that says, Lord, Lord, is saved. But those that do as will, why? Because they love the truth. And they love the author of truth. And they love the word of truth. And they receive the word of truth that is the engrafted word that saved their soul. And that's why many in the, in the public church will say, Lord, we were there. We were working. And he says, yeah, yeah. But you never received a love of the truth. You're not saved. And those who don't receive the love of the truth are not saved. And Satan amazes all them. Because they don't know truth, they don't have any moorings, they don't have any foundations, they just go with the flow, and he's the flow. So look what happens in verse 11. It actually gets worse. Truth's abandoned, God's abandoned, Satan amazes the world. And so what does God do? He adds to the mix. God sends strong delusion on people who are truth neglectors. In other words, he says, you've been neglecting the truth so long, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to send strong delusion. I'm going to infect you with the malicious virus that you're going to love error. And strong delusion. Verse 11, and for this reason God will send them strong delusion, that they should believe the lie, that they all may be condemned who did not believe the truth but had pleasure in unrighteousness. Born-again people love the truth and have no pleasure in unrighteousness. Unsaved people, don't, they neglect, they don't have hunger, they don't love the truth, and they have pleasure in unrighteousness. And God sends them strong delusion. But look back at verse 11 for just a moment because that's the tie to the first seal. Look what it says in verse 11. God will send them strong delusion. Now, turn to Revelation 6, 2. Real quickly, you should know where it is. In fact, mine has a, a spot. I always put my thumb there. It's starting to turn brown. You know, we need to turn the page. But, but look at 6.2, what it says. It says, and he gives him, verse 2, and was given to him a crown, and he went out conquering and to conquer. God introduces and allows this strong delusion to be coming on those who are not truth lovers. And that is the saddest part. Global delusion on the unrighteous ones. And that is exactly what Jesus said. In fact, in Matthew 24, Jesus said, Many will come in my name saying I'm the Christ. Do you remember? Jesus' longest sermon, Matthew 24 and 25, I mean as long as answered any question, made a huge sermon. What he said is there's false Christ and false prophets coming. And he says they're coming. There's a timeless lesson here because those who don't love the truth are lawless. They, they love unrighteousness. If you don't love the truth, truth is a guard against unrighteousness. Because you love the truth, you hate. Let everyone that names the name of Christ depart from iniquity. There, there's a connection between loving the truth, which is Jesus Christ, and hating sin, which is unrighteousness, unchristlike behavior. Matthew 24, 24 also says that this false Christ and false prophet will rise and show great signs and wonders to deceive, if it were possible, even the elect. It's going to come to the point that if it was possible for a believer to become an unbeliever, it would happen. It's going to be that people that are saved and living during the tribulation hour when Satan is absolutely unthrottled in emanating through the Antichrist. If it were possible to unsave someone, they would get unsaved. But you know what Jesus says in Matthew 24, 24? If it was possible, even the elect, the way it's written in the Greek language, it is not possible, but if it were possible, it would happen, but it is not. It is not possible for us to be plucked out of his hand. Now unto him that is able, Jude 23 and 24 say, to keep us from falling. Jesus is able and he keeps us, he holds us. But Satan's going to be very strong. Well, this hurricane of apostasy is blowing stronger and stronger every day, but it's been around for a long time. The hurricane didn't start in the 80s when I noticed pastors going to church light. You know, heavy on media and light on word. Heavy on entertaining, light on truth. It's old. In fact, a century ago, things were so bad, 100 years ago in America, that the visible church and the followers of Christ, 100 years ago, there were so many profusions of cults. I mean, the Mormons were just 
taken over and the Jehovah's Witnesses were just marching from the watchtower and there was theosophy and Christian science and all of these cults and prophets. I mean, we don't even think about that. It was so bad a hundred years ago that the greatest Bible teachers of the day in that generation banded together and said, we're going to raise a flag of truth. We're going to, we're going to define truth for the church because so many people are falling away. And so this group of conservative Bible-believing and teaching pastors and professors sat down over a six-year period and wrote down on paper and published the non-negotiables of faith. And what they did is they published these over six years from 1909 to 1915 as, as position papers on what they called the fundamentals of the faith. And they titled their, their seven-volume work, The Fundamentals. Have you ever heard of fundamentalists? That's where it comes from, from 100 years ago. From, from this galaxy of Bible teaching, Bible professors and doctrine extraordinaires who defined Christianity and called it The Fundamentals of Christianity. At the end of days, truth is under attack. Jesus says, watch out for false teachers and counterfeit religion. So when they were faced with this profusion of false teachers, the true defense of orthodox doctrine was written down. Now, let me just read to you who they called on. They called on R.A. Torrey. You say, who's that? You ever heard of D.L. Moody, the evangelist from Chicago? This was his assistant that traveled with him. And, and R.A. Torrey was more of the Bible teacher, and, and Moody was the evangelist. And R.A. Torrey founded the Bible Institute of Los Angeles. It's called Biola today. That's what it stands for, Bible Institute of Los Angeles, Biola. But they called on Tory. Then B.B. Warfield from Westminster Seminary and J.C. Ryle. He was a very well-known pastor and devotional writer. And then G. Campbell Morgan. It's kind of like the John Piper, John MacArthur of the day. He was an expository, verse-by-verse pastor. And then C.I. Schofield, he, he wrote a study Bible, kind of like the Ryrie study Bible. And then James M. Gray, the president of Moody Bible Institute. And then A.T. Pearson, he was kind of like the Chuck Swindoll of day. And they, they called together this group of men, and these men wrote down and distilled down Christian doctrine to seven key doctrines. And this is what they said. They called them the fundamental seven essential doctrines. I'll just read them to you. I have nine minutes to read them to you. Here they are. Number one, inspiration. All we know and believe about the Bible is based on God's word, so they affirm the inspiration and reliable historicity of the Bible. And their, their key verse was 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17. Secondly, they said doctrine. Now, this is 100 years ago. Doctrine must be held. God's word teaches that clear doctrine must be taught to Jesus Christ and his church. So they specifically named the cults of 100 years ago who presented false doctrine in their day. And they named them as the Jehovah's Witnesses, Mormonism, Christian Science, Spiritism, and Theosophy. And they said they are wrong in their doctrine. So they, they said, there's an ancient landmark, don't move it. I mean, do you hear that nowadays? That, that Mormonism is wrong? Are you kidding? If we're going to have a men's gathering, we're going to have the Mormons. They're moral. They're, they're pro-life, pro-family. Don't leave them out, right? Doctrine divides. Haven't you ever heard that? Doctrine divides. It sure does. It divides the truth lovers from the lost. That's what it divides. Then depravity. That's the third doctrine they emphasize. God's word declares the reality of sin, and they affirm man is not basically good, but born a sinner. That was all at the beginning of the, this idea at the end of World War I that if you just cleaned up the environment in the inner cities that everybody would get happy and nice to each other. The, the real cancer is in the soul. It's not in the slums. And, and so they affirm depravity. As it says in Romans 5, 12, through one man sin entered into the world and death through sin and death spread to all men because all have sinned. And then they had a two-part. This one was the, the most amazing one of all. Right in the center of their the fundamentals, they, they had two parts. Substitution, God's word presents biblical salvation as received only by faith in the God incarnate Christ who became our substitute. We call that the substitutionary atonement, that Jesus took our place on the cross. The verse is 2 Corinthians 5.21. God made Christ who knew no sin to be sin for us. So Jesus became our substitute. He became our sin on the cross. But the second half of that is imputation. 
That's one you don't hear about anymore. This is what they said. The second half of 2 Corinthians 5.21 says that we might become the righteousness of God in him, that we are imputed Christ's righteousness. We don't earn it. We don't receive doses of it. It's given to us by faith through Christ. And what they said this, God's word teaches about imputation that salvation cannot be earned at any level. Salvation is dispensed by God and not by any church nor any clergy. Thus, they clearly expose the errors of Roman Catholicism and every other religion of human achievement and works righteousness. I mean, you could never say that nowadays. Mission boards all over the world say, you can't leave out the Catholics. I mean, they're, they're with us. With what? If you have the gospel wrong, what are you with? How can you do missions if the gospel's wrong? And they don't believe in imputation. They believe in diffusion. They believe that you get a little dose at confirmation, and that gets you one step on Monopoly board toward heaven. And then you come to confession, you get another dose, and, and then you do penance, and you get another dose, and you go to the Mass, and you get a big dose. And, and it's, it's, it's being saved by installments, not saved by grace once and for all. Then Christology, they affirm the deity, the work, and personal visible return of Christ. Here's a great verse, 2 John 1, 9 through 11. Whoever transgresses and does not abide in the doctrine of Christ does not have God. So if you don't have the doctrine of Christ right, you don't have God. And you know what they said? What 2 John says. Whoever abides in the doctrine of Christ has both the Father and the Son. And if anybody comes to you and doesn't bring the doctrine of Christ, don't receive him into your house. You know what that means when the Jehovah's Witnesses come at my door and they have their big case, you know, that looks like a sewing machine they're carrying, usually a couple or three of them. Or the Mormons come with their white shirt, you know, and sporty and young and their little name tag, and they knock, and they're smiley. You know, every one of my neighbors know what we believe because we've shared the gospel with them. And they, we let the smiley white shirts in. They'll think, oh, they're probably, from their, they're probably from Calvary. I bet they are. If they come to my house, I'll talk to them too. That's why, you know what the Lord says? Don't even let them into your house. Don't greet them. For he who greets them shares in their evil deeds. Don't confuse people about the doctrine of Christ, no matter how they smile or how white their shirt is. Finally, the last one, the seventh doctrine, amazingly, that they affirmed in 1909, was the doctrine of creation. And they said that God is revealed from cover to cover in his word as the creator of the universe. He created it just as he described it in the Bible. And so we expose, they said, the grave errors of evolutionism and Darwinism. Boy, are they out of step. The last hundred years, by and large, Christianity has embraced, not exposed. And they use Colossians 1, 15 to 17. Well, the scriptures tell us that there's a hurricane blowing all around us. And the hurricane is against God, against doctrine, against truth. And, and the Lord says, get ready for it and don't allow it to slowly push you away from where you stand on truth. We're living in the gale force winds. Are you anchored to Christ? Do you know the doctrine of Christ? Do you know and love the truth? That's the mark of salvation. Let's bow for a word of prayer. Father in heaven, I thank you for Calvary Bible Church. We believe in the work you did on Calvary and we know it because it's from the Bible and that defines who a true church is. And not everybody that calls you Lord, Lord is going to heaven. It's those who love the truth and have embraced the doctrine of Christ. I pray that we would be truth lovers, truth students, truth seekers, not just putting up with it, not just tolerating it, but pursuing it, embracing it, and differentiating when false teaching permeates our world. And Lord, I pray for some that are like that sweet Mongolian businesswoman, that you are stirring their hearts and giving them a hunger for the truth. I pray that we would find those 
who are longing for the truth and introduce them to you, Lord Jesus. You are the way. You are the life. You are the truth. And if they will receive the engrafted word of your truth, they can be saved. I pray that you draw some truth seekers to become truth lovers today. And help us as we go to be anchored in your word. In the precious name of Jesus, we pray. And all of God's people said, amen. God bless you as you go.